we see a whole scale attack on open source software developers in Bitcoin happening now. They're competing against nation states, people who are able to solve the overall equation of mining economics in different ways, which is what makes it one of the most cutthroat, soul crushing businesses on the planet. Most mining operations are not in a position where they're able to stack meaningful amounts of Bitcoin. Was there anything that surprised you from that halving? We need to give Bitcoin a little bit of breathing room, give the developers breathing room to innovate and continue to bring better products and services. I see a future where everybody uses Bitcoin because it is actually the base layer of our financial system. We also want to provide a real sense of community for Bitcoiners. Did you always wanted to, to have a bar? Is this like something that you always had in mind or was this coming out like randomly? <sighs> Jeez, I guess, I guess a mix of, of both. I've always really enjoyed um, specifically like New York City, like pubs and taverns. We call them dive bars here. Um, and it's also one of the best ways to, uh, uh, to travel is to find something that's not just sort of like a, a, um, a magnet for tourists or people that are just passing through. If you can find something that is hyper local, it's uh, uh, just like that normal pub, tavern, you know, bar is um, a really great way to get a much better sense of a local culture. Uh, local cuisine, the way that they drink, the way that they talk and interact with each other, that like cadence, um, you know, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the guard comes down, right, especially in in heavily trafficked, like touristy areas. Like if you go, you know, even to like Rome or Paris, I mean, these are um, like pri like uh, sort of premier tourist destinations. And you can get one sort of view into a local area that way. And New York City is like this as well. You're going to get a very, very different vibe in a Times Square than you will just going to sort of um, a, a local family owned neighborhood tavern. Um, so that's always been of interest, but I never had any background in hospitality. Um, in fact, most of the founding team didn't have background in hospitality. My wife and I and a group of friends in COVID, um, you know, I think it became painfully uh apparent just how important these places are um a lot of them in new york city were closing um you know these these taverns specifically in new york city are, are family run um and when something like covid hits uh combined with inflation and you know rent going through the roof it's really hard to operate a hospitality business uh in that sort of you know uh, uh economic uh environment so this was a passion project in that sense. Our, uh, my wife and I lived a couple blocks away from the bar that was previously where PubKey um, is now. Uh, so we had been coming to this spot um, for, for many years and it was you know, near and dear to our heart. But the other thing that was happening in COVID was a lot of Bitcoiners uh, were leaving New York City for other cities, right? Austin and Nashville definitely being two of, uh, of the biggest ones, Miami as well. Um, so what we saw was a bit of a hollowing out of the Bitcoin community through COVID. And we had this idea to create, you know, space uh, for people that could really cultivate uh, and support and help grow that community that was getting uh, a fair amount of attrition just because of, you know, what was happening through the pandemic. So we started the project in 2021. Um, and it takes a long time when you're dealing with, you know, renting a commercial lease in the city. Uh, dealing with, um, you know, acquiring a liquor license, getting the approvals, all that stuff, and then construction and standing up an actual restaurant uh, operation is is a tremendous amount of work. Um, so it started in 2021, and we finally opened our doors in October of 2022. And you know, we've been we've been fortunate to, you know, one thing about Bitcoiners are they're tremendously loyal and passionate. So we've had a lot of help from the community to help fill in some of the blind spots that we had, particularly around hospitality and some other elements of what we hope to accomplish here. Um, but it, it really is a um, an expansive project. We're trying to pull in, you know, obviously the foundation is that that kitchen and bar, the, the tavern, the local community. Um, and I would say about 75 to 80 percent of our customers are still not Bitcoiners. But we also want to provide a, a real sense of community for Bitcoiners. And the way that we express that is through our you know, weekly Bitcoin programming, which is at least once a week, usually on Thursdays. But now it's at the point where we have at least two or three uh, Bitcoin programming events on a weekly basis. And 
almost all of these, very few exceptions, almost all of them have been free and open to the public. Um, and we like to capture as much of that as we can, you know, uh, digitally for dissemination on YouTube, Spotify, things like that. Um, so that people that cannot be in the room are still able to participate in that community building. Um, so it started as, you know, a passion project and it's grown into, you know, a full fledged business over, over, you know, the last, I don't know, two years at this point coming up on two years. Yeah. And, and I feel like community is such an important aspect. Uh, ju just a quick question. Like, why like, I, I noticed that even from, from Austria, because, uh, people made, made videos about it, leaving New York City for Miami, for Austin, for Nashville. Like it was all over social media. It was something that was known internationally, but I never understood like why were people living in New York City? I think Washington was also like one place people left. Uh, I feel like, but I'm, maybe I'm uh, wrong. Why, why New York City? Was it like taxes? Was it policies? Was it what are problems? For sure. I think that the, the, the taxes and the policies, particularly um, uh, uh, as it pertains to running a Bitcoin business in New York City, when you're dealing with the bit license, that's definitely a, a pretty ex expensive barrier. Um, but just on like a human level, like the cost of the cost of living in New York City is quite high. And one of the reasons why New York City is such a special place is because you have um, just an abundance of um, experiences, opportunities, bars and restaurants, you know, theater, comedy, music venues, sports, everything. So, you know, COVID was a, a, a rather um, extreme event that takes a lot of the, you know, uh, reason why people love New York City away. If you don't, if, if you see the, the closure of a lot of businesses that provide that amazing diversity of experiences and opportunities, then the cost of living becomes a little bit more and more expensive. It takes an emotional toll. It takes a financial toll on um, on individuals. It's different if you know young and single, and you know uh, 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 you you you're able to sort of navigate that in a, a slightly different way. But as people start to have families, I think that those financial pressures become a little bit more um, taxing, uh, and you feel the loss of uh, the experience and opportunity even more severely in that, in that event. Um, COVID is, is pretty much gone. I mean, you don't really see people in masks or, you know, talking about it, but I think the business hangover uh, is still, is still lasting a little bit in certain neighborhoods. New York city is mostly back, um, but there are certain neighborhoods that you can still see uh, a bit of a COVID hangover. Uh, lots of people, I, I think that we're going to have, um, a very, very long effect of people wanting to work remotely, not go to an office five days a week. And what that means is, you know, entire neighborhoods that are really built around, you know, um, office economies, like Midtown, where you have these gigantic office buildings, the bars and restaurants there are seeing fewer people that are there during the week. Um, so they're a little bit better. And we're seeing people go back to the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But Monday and Friday is still a bit negotiable. People can work from home. They can focus on their family. They can, you know, not have to deal with the daily commute. You know, three days a week is better than five days a week. So the, the, the commercial ramifications of that societal change are still apparent in certain areas. But other areas of Manhattan are, are back and we're starting to see a lot more bars, restaurants, other things um, um, open up finally. But it took, it took a fair amount of time. Yeah, and I feel like, as I said it before, COVID showed us so good that it's so important to have community, to have places to hang out. And, and I mean, I also respect Bitcoiners that don't want to get uh, toxed at all and they just want to stay isolated and don't want to go anywhere close to like a Bitcoin area. And, but I feel like if, if you kind of can convince yourself to do it, like there are so many different ways. There's like the Orange Pill app. There's like local Bitcoin meetups. There are Bitcoin conferences. There are like as pubkey Bitcoin bars or local restaurants where you can go. There's so many different ways to get in touch with uh, Bitcoiners and uh, especially uh, for a community that is uh, driven through so many highs and lows. Uh, it it can really help to just uh, engage with with real people in real life and just have conversation at least for me it has a had a big impact like before i met any bitcoiners online 
um, I met any Bitcoiners offline. It was completely different for me. It had a, a different impact on my life. I took it really more seriously. I had the podcast and way more stuff on that. But uh, I feel like that's that's really important to have communities. I, I love projects like the PubKey. Thank you. Um, that means a lot. And, um, you know, I think that there is a, a, a big difference or there's there's a need that, that we try to, to fill. Orange Pill App, you know, um, the online communities, Twitter, it's great to talk to like-minded people. Um, and, you know, there's also arguments amongst like-minded people. I like to say that like a flame war on Twitter that lasts months could be solved over a beer or two uh, at a bar. Um, and it also makes, I think, Bitcoiners as a broader community much more accessible and relatable. Um, if somebody's interested in Bitcoin, um, sometimes I think that conferences can be a bad experience because they're quite expensive. You have to travel for them. You have, you know, a flight, a hotel. You go to the conference and the conference can be quite overwhelming. If you're, if you're you know, just getting into Bitcoin, I think that some people experience sort of a, a painful awareness that they're not invited to you know, the dinners or the parties or like the high signal, like in crowd events, you're sort of thrust into a large expo um, where there's a sea of, of booths, there's lots of marketing, there's talks that a lot of people have, can already access, right? A, a lot of the, the content at conferences, sometimes there's announcements, but, you know, the stuff that, 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 that the conversations that happen on panels and things like that, I, I don't think are, are what people are really looking for. Uh, when they're going to their first Bitcoin conference, they're looking for community. And that, that's something entirely different. It's, it's hard to achieve that sense of community over the course of three days for a newcomer. But, you know, if you have a location like a pub key or a standing Bitcoin meetup, right, even if, even if it's a monthly meetup, um, you're able to actually have that, you know, human touch, that, that in-person dynamic where you can have a, a real conversation there can be, you know, vulnerability uh, expressed in a, in, a, in, a, in a slightly, you know, more confident way where you can actually, you know, not be afraid of asking dumb questions on Twitter and just getting like dogpiled by people that are saying that's a really dumb question. Uh, over a beer, like you're, you're almost both sides are forced to uh, engage effectively with one another. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And and. The conference, as you said, can be really overwhelming. Uh, I mean, I loved it last year, for example, in Prague, where I think like 6,000 people were there. It's yep. uh, way smaller than, for example, a Nashville conference where, I don't know, 20, 30,000 or like really a lot of more people were there. Um, but still, it's a lot of people. Um, what was good for me because I, I, I saw a lot of energy. Uh, the energy was uh, it was really nice there. The talks, as you said, they're all online anyway, so unless you're in the VIP area where there's not shared like online, then you can get something. And, but it's also not, nothing to surprise. Like there's no, no really new things. The only really good thing is like you have one place where all of the companies are, you have a nice overview. I really enjoy going from booth to booth and talking with the people, talking what they're doing. Like, but, but maybe that's just me. It, it was like, I really liked the overview and the seeing all the companies, what do they do here and or who is here, who is not here and stuff like that. But maybe that's no, just I'm the, I'm the that's same just way. I, I spend most of my time, you know, going from booth to booth and seeing familiar faces and, and new ones can collect uh, whatever, whatever marketing swag that they have. Lots of stickers for my daughters, things like that. That's, that's where uh, I spend my time at conferences. <laughs> yeah, also, I'm, I'm a lot of times in the booth area, actually. <laughs> uh, I feel like in Prague, I only, yeah, I only saw the Michael Saylor uh, presentation and all the rest. I was in the booth <laughs> for three days straight. Yeah, but um, uh, coming back to the bar, I... I saw it only on Twitter. I wasn't, I'm not, wasn't sure. Is, was the auction of the Bitcoin sign in the Babki bar? Yeah, so... Um... The Bitcoin sign guy, his name's Christian Langellis, um, auctioned the original sign. Um, he used, we didn't do, we didn't facilitate the auction or anything like that. He used um, scarcity um, to facilitate the actual auction itself. Um, but on the last day when the countdown was, um, uh, 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 was initiated, there's this like hot zone where the new highest bid, you know, triggers a, a five uh, a five minute clock for any other competing bids. So we had a small group of people, and in just like a really 
uh, amazingly special um, turn of fate. Um, you know, the, 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 the gentleman that won the auction is a New Yorker and he came to PubKey and he was live bidding, you know, from PubKey, um, which was super exciting. It went for um, a, a great number, well-deserved by Christian. I think the, the Bitcoin sign is probably the most iconic Bitcoin meme. Um, so that's really a Bitcoin artifact in, in many ways. Um, so that was a, that was a very special event. And that happened, you know, right after the halving, um, we had a big, you know, NFT NYC was in New York. So all of the Bitcoin and ordinal activity, you know, really migrated to PubKey in one, one form or another. Um, so April was a pretty intense month for us. Um, I, I, I was, I was happy to see, you know, the calendar turn to May. Uh, uh, eventually, because we worked pretty hard here at PubKey to accomplish all these events. But even in May, we have a ton of stuff as well. With Pizza Day coming up, we're, we're screening um, the New York premiere of um, uh, My Trust in You is Broken. Um, and uh, we, we, we always have, you know, something going on here. But that, that Bitcoin sign auction was um, probably one of the top highlights uh, since we've opened the doors. And it, it, it was fascinating for me. I, I just quickly saw it and I was like, oh, it's interesting. And, and I took the photo and, and uh, reposted it. And it was quasi, crazy. It was going really uh, long and people were having basically three different kinds of opinions. The, the first was like, oh, it's never worth that. Keep the Bitcoin. The, first, the second was like, oh, it's an, such an iconic thing. You have to have it. If you have the possibility to buy it, then you have to have it. The third one, like, yeah. It's free market if obviously it's it's worth that if, if someone is willing to pay the price uh, what was your opinion on on, on the auction is like I, I mean like it's it's probably the most iconic meme like uh, I, I shared it myself so many times before the auction uh, even, before I even knew about the auction so I, I feel like when a meme deserves that then it's that meme uh, but like what's your opinion on on, on the, the the whole debate on is it worth it? <laughs> is it worth it, 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 it? Was the sign worth worth the price that uh, it, it went for? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, th there's always this free market answer where, like, of course, when someone pays for it, then it's worth it. Uh, but there's always this this long term then thing. Like, do you, do you think uh, the sign will outperform Bitcoin in like fifty years, oh. assuming that the sign is still there and it doesn't get burned or watered or something like that? <laughs> I don't know. It'll be interesting to see um, if there is a sale, how it does in, in, in Bitcoin terms as opposed to like dollar terms. Um, you know, it might not be. It'll be. <laughs> look, um, it's anybody's guess. I think it'll be a little bit harder for it to continue to appreciate in Bitcoin terms, um, uh, maybe a little bit easier in dollar terms. Um, but I'm not surprised that it went for the number it did because of how iconic and how special it actually is. Like, it, it, it's not the legal pad that was scribbled. It's what it's what it represents and it, what it's what, you know, um, that artifact is. So there's always going to be collectors, whether it's somebody's, you know, somebody's buying Babe Ruth's, you know, uh, baseball glove or bat or, or something like that. Um, collectors want a sense of... Um, you know, ownership over a moment in time and, and history. Um, and if Bitcoin continues to be a thing uh, and does what I, you know, think it can do, what many other Bitcoiners think it can do, then it's hard to, it's hard to imagine an artifact of more importance than that legal pad. Um, the moment in time when you had um, uh, uh, the chair of the Federal Reserve talking about, you know, whether or not the Fed will ever face an audit Bitcoin on the precipice of a major, major run. Um, it, it was really coming into its own. And I think a lot of what was happening in the global financial markets really sort of um, was starting to highlight Bitcoin's importance in all of that. Um, so I'm kind of hard pressed to think of other Bitcoin artifacts. Maybe maybe the um, um, uh, the newspaper that you know Satoshi quoted, Chancellor on the Brink, um, there are a lot of copies of that. There's only one of the, um, the sign itself, maybe the Casatius coins, um, you know, but this is, this is definitely up there. And if you look at like the, the importance and the global reach and the value of the Bitcoin network, I think collectors are always going to look to, you know, these tangible artifacts of, uh, historical import to, um, to value, um, 
but again, I think it'll be really interesting to see how um, how it's valued in the future uh, in Bitcoin terms and in dollar terms. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the, the shift that we we have to make. Uh, I mean, I always kind of try to do it uh, and think of like when I start to purchase something bigger or start to think of like, oh, is it a good investment or is it good uh, that I can get something out of it? Um, when you think in dollars, it's always kind of a good decision. Like not a lot of things are uh, worse than the dollars. Of course, there are things that are worse than the dollars, out of fear currencies and stuff like that. But uh, they are not like, for example, houses. A house will always appreciate uh, in dollar terms, but I think it will always depreciate uh, in, in, in Bitcoin terms because Bitcoin is just a way better form uh, of, of storing financial energy over long term. And you saw it over the last 10 years, and I think you will see it in the next 10 years. Uh, but in dollar terms, of course, it goes up because, yeah, if you print so much money, it's it's kind of <laughs> kind of self yeah, runner. Yeah. There's, a, there's a really interesting psychological component to that. Um, if you think about the Silk Road, um, bags of drugs yielded a fair amount of Bitcoin, right? In, in notional Bitcoin terms that like, you know, they're not worth that at all anymore. Um, and maybe if Christian had sold the Bitcoin sign um, years earlier, depending on what the market was doing, that might have yielded more Bitcoin. Um, for the transaction. Um, so I wonder if we should all be selling everything for Bitcoin now uh, <laughs> or in dollar terms and converting it immediately to capture as much Bitcoin as possible. Um, because I think that there is a very um, plausible scenario where that Bitcoin sign is not going for the same amount of notional Bitcoin uh, in the near future for the next sale. Or maybe this collector is going to hold on to it forever. We don't, we don't, we don't know what's, what, um, uh, what he values uh, in terms of ownership of that artifact going forward. Uh, it might be that he just like really likes that moment and he wants just us to own that moment and take it yeah. with him forever. Like that's, that's for his bathroom or something so he can see it every day. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but let's get into my actual questions that I had for you. <laughs> um, I, as you are involved in a lot of, of Bitcoin mining um, and I never covered that topic as much as I should cover it. Um, Bitcoin mining is evolving. I feel like when you come to the old, old days where you can mine with a bit, uh, with a computer, uh, then graphic cards, then we are with the ASICs now and uh, it, it becomes more and more like a specialized business. I feel like, um, is there, is there like when we lo look at the long run of Bitcoin mining and like the game theory behind, behind Bitcoin mining, um, is there any, um, threat to it where it gets too centralized. I mean, we saw it 2017 that the Bitcoin miners are not like in control. Like we, we know that uh, the Bitcoin miners, just when you can concentrate your Bitcoin miners, it's not as uh, as uh, yeah, as a big of a threat. But is is it a problem that Bitcoin miners is kind of a threat and can like uh, small products like a Bitcoin heater uh, or like having Bitcoin miner connect to your solar roof and Will it be decentralized in the future? Is that do, do you think of, of that on this? Like, how do you see it evolving in the next like fifty years? Yeah, I think there will be an ebb and flow um, to sort of uh, large scale, um, you know, public miners with these massive data centers. Um, there is an interesting dynamic between these public miners who are are mining for uh, increasing shareholder value always denominated in local currency, right? They, they want to see the dollar value of these, uh, of these um, companies and organizations go up. Um, these companies and organizations are competing against hobbyists. They're competing against in nation states, um, people in other or anywhere in the world that have, you know, much cheaper electricity or are able to steal electricity or, or um, are able to solve uh, the overall equation of, of mining economics in different ways which is what makes it one of the most cutthroat, soul-crushing businesses on the planet. And I think that there will always be an ebb and flow between centralization and decentralization. I, I'm not terribly concerned about that because I, I actually think that the incentives are, are really elegantly balanced. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful protocol, the way that it's um, 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 designed. I think that the um, concern when we talk about centralization and mining is it, for me is, is more at the pool level than at individual miners because individual miners can effectively, you know, set up some rigs. If they have access to some ASICs, they have electricity, 
not all miners mine for uh, U.S. dollar profits. Some are mining just to capture an amount of Bitcoin. Some are mining to get access to a global financial network that is not sort of censored and controlled in the same way that, let's say, the SWIFT network or the correspondent banking network is. And I think that that will always, always exist in some capacity. But when we look at um, mining pools, which are effectively um, a swap product uh, between the pool and an individual miner trading variants and smoothing out sort of um, the, uh, the revenue streams, uh, that's where we could see uh, a little bit of a concern uh, around whether it's a regulatory threat or um, a threat that comes from uh, a particular company running a large pool themselves um, to, to potentially um, manipulate things or, or, or get away from um, uh, Bitcoin the way it, it, it ought to operate. Um, but in terms of large scale miners, uh, one of the best examples that we had was the, the capacity in China just after COVID was tremendous. And then there's the Chinese ban. Um, a lot of that equipment, you know, uh, goes to other jurisdictions. We saw a lot of it go to Texas, elsewhere in the United States, South America. Um, a lot of it, you know, over into uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Um, it'll always sort of find its level. Uh, and I think miners will always find uh, the most uh, favorable uh, conditions, not just from a power uh, price perspective, but also, you know, other things that are in the mix in terms of, you know, regulatory climate, um, you know, operating concerns, things like that. Um, now there's a lot of concentration in Texas in the US, um, but what we've seen in China since is I think a lot of hash rate has been plugged back in there. It's hard to tell exactly how much, but um, you get these sort of cockroach uh, operations that are able to pop back up uh, even in places where there is, um, I would say, more um, regulatory hostility um, uh, than elsewhere or than previously before. So it's always evolving. And I think that, you know, just after the halving, we're going to see some of that, some of those catalysts a little bit more. Um, you know, there is always an inventory flush. There is always pain as the supply side economics change, even though we know about it. I, I, I'm not um, uh, totally um, subscribed to efficient market hypothesis, particularly in the mining uh, industry. Um, so I think a lot of the ramifications of the having are still yet to play out. That historically has taken, you know, a couple of quarters um, to actually see uh, consolidation occur in the in the in the mining industry. Um, but I think, you know, we'll, we'll continue to see um, an ebb and flow from centralization to decentralization on the minor level, um, a little bit more of a concern around the uh, mining pool level. Mm. What, what do you mean with uh, the ramification of the Bitcoin halving? Like what, what, what does the Bitcoin halving has as an impact after, after it happened? Yeah. So, you know, miners, uh, all miners are operating in local currency to buy equipment, to buy electricity, to pay for labor, to maintain data centers, all of that stuff. So everything on the cost side for miners is denominated in the local currency, let's just say dollars here in the US. Um, the revenue side of the equation is denominated in Bitcoin. They, they receive Bitcoin for the you know the hash rate production they're able to put out there. Um, so there's always uh, an inherent imbalance that needs to be dealt with for any mining operation. Embedded in hash rate, you have a lot of volatility risks. You have the market price of Bitcoin, um, you have difficulty adjustments, you have variance, which we talked about a little bit earlier. You have, you know, transaction fee volatility right now. Um, when you have uh, sort of difficulty or having right, there's less Bitcoin that all miners are competing for. So there's less, less available revenue. We haven't seen the price, the market price of Bitcoin double to offset that. Um, we saw a spike in transaction fees, which was very short lived and, you know, may not be sustainable enough to totally offset that. So if a mining operation has a business where it says this is my you know, cost side of the equation and I, I'm, I'm sustainable at these levels. But then on the revenue side that gets slashed by 50 percent, there is a very difficult recalibration. I would say for, for most miners, there are some miners that are large enough. Um, they were able to build, um, you know, a robust enough um, 
uh, uh, treasury, like war chest to deal with this and to continue to expand. Um, but I think that that calibration, that market-wide uh, uh, recalibration is, is is still playing out. So it's interesting in mining because uh, they, they mine Bitcoin and they always have to they also have the possibility basically to also have uh, m to stack more Bitcoin in the short term when they think it's like a bear market to like uh, profit from that if, if there's a bull market. I mean, I have like, I don't operate a mine. I have no clue about mining on a, a detailed level. I was just like now thinking, uh, is, is there other some this, those, those strategies where like, okay, if, if the price seems low compared to the usual four year cycle where you stack a little bit more, and then uh, when, when there's a bull market coming, uh, then you try to like prepare for the upcoming bear market. I guess this is like usual financial stuff like as, as all, all, all companies, <laughs> even outside of Bitcoin miners do. Yeah, look, that's a great question. So there, that, that's like on the treasury management side of things. Let, let's assume they, they're able to cover all their costs um, and now they're sitting with an amount of Bitcoin. Um, what miners are also uh, painfully aware of, most miners are painfully aware of, if um, if a mining operation's hash rate production is not growing at the rate the overall network is growing, they're effectively being diluted. So they have to grow at or above the rate of change for cumulative hash rate um, uh, uh, for the entire network to protect against dilution and also to become more and more competitive, to capture more of that, that, um, that share of Bitcoin that's being released. If they're, if they're in that dilutive state, if they are not growing at the same rate of you know, the, the overall network growth, they're being diluted and that's a losing situation. They can do it for a period of time. There are ways to deal with it uh, through you know, treasury management, hedging, stuff like that. But then you're starting to get into sophisticated financial products and not everybody has that capabilities in house. And it, it doesn't always offset some of the risks because um, that that ends up being a, a, a very, very complicated, complicated way to to approach things. So they capture a certain amount of Bitcoin. They're able to pay all their costs, which are you know dollar denominated, whatever. They're left with a certain amount of Bitcoin, then they effectively have to decide, all right, we want to keep as much Bitcoin as possible, but we do have to keep growing. So it's a reinvestment in the operation to protect against dilution. Um, and then, you know, when they, when they, you know, set that, let's say, you know, costs are 50% and we, we need to grow at another 20%. So let's just say there's 30% profit. You know, do we hold on to that in Bitcoin uh, and hope that we see a part of the cycle where that is going to appreciate? Um, or do we want to lock this in uh, in U.S. dollars to pay in case we have a bad month or, you know, um, something at the facility breaks down and we need more more investment to fix things, um, taxes, whatever uh, can pop up. Um, you know, some mining operations, just like any other company, if Treasury management catches you at the wrong time, uh, let's say let's say Bitcoin is is down 40 percent in that period and you have a large tax bill you weren't expecting or there's a fire at the data center that you need to repair um, or, or, or something like that happens. It becomes a very, very delicate dance, which is why I think, you know, most mining operations are not in a position where they're able to stack meaningful amounts of Bitcoin. Um, you know, it would be nice to see them all. But I think that they are natural forced sellers for the vast majority of Bitcoin that they mine. Um, and that's probably going to continue. And there are edge cases, right? So like a, a, um, a home miner, a hobbyist may say, this is just the cost of, of my hobby. I'll pay electricity. I'll pay for new equipment. I don't care if I'm de being diluted. It's nice to get Bitcoin. Those hobbyists are definitely more likely um, to be stacking the Bitcoin that they receive. Um, and it's also being received in a way uh, outside of exchanges in a, in, a, in a no KYC fashion. So, you know, some would say that there is more value attached to that. Um, I think that there is, you know, a counter argument to that. Um, but if people believe that that has value, it has value. Same as, you know, a legal notepad that somebody scribbled by Bitcoin on. But um, yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of dynamics. Bitcoin mining is is definitely one of the most complicated and fascinating, brutal industries on the planet. 
If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in the middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague Conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. What what also is fascinating for me in the Bitcoin uh, mining hash rate, uh, while they, because when I came into Bitcoin, my conclusion was like, oh, the hash rate is uh, depending on the Bitcoin price, but it seems like it's not uh, because the mining hash rate has been up, up, up. It's all time high, even when the Bitcoin price was was down like fifty, sixty percent of the all time high, and the hash rate kept hitting all time highs. Uh, is that because as you described that the uh, miners to not be diluted has to keep up with the growing network. If everyone tries always to grow and new, new people come in and new companies come in and try also to mine because it's a new and exciting uh, um, business and industry to be in. Uh, is that the, the sole reason why it's, it keeps growing even though the price like is not keeping up sometimes? This is a this is this is an old question that I don't think anybody has really like zeroed in on a final answer for. It's whether like price does price follow hash rate or does hash rate follow price, um, and I think it depends. In certain circumstances, you can make the argument one way. In circumstances, you can make it the other way. Um, you have a lot of like energy companies that see an arbitrage through mining Bitcoin. Um, if you have enough people that uh, observe some of the elegant solutions that um, a mining company is able to um, uh, take advantage of, then more likely than not, you're going to have some people in that organization and around that organization see value in Bitcoin itself. And they're going to want to have some, they're going to soak up more supply. Um, there's a bit of a dance between the, 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 the two. Um, and it really depends on when uh, in terms of the, the relationship between um, price and hash rate and how that progresses. Um, the last thing. <laughs> I think I think a lot of it right now has been sort of uh, mostly driven by any energy uh, arbitrage opportunities um, and uh, finding business models that work in certain locations and then other people recognizing that and say like, hey, I have a similar situation and I can buy some of these rigs, set up a data center um, and you know, make money off of, let's say, a wasted or a stranded energy asset or an energy asset that's heavily subsidized by the government. Um, there are many such cases. There's there's a lot of um, uh, of different ways to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, last question on the Bitcoin mining. Uh, was there anything that surprised you from that halving? Anything that was unnatural, uh, that was maybe not in, in previous uh, halvings. I think the, the one thing that I've noticed, uh, we hit the all time high before the halving, uh, but it's just US dollar price action that uh, I think never happened before. Was there anything that surprised you with this halving or was it uh, pretty much like all the other halvings? Yeah, so the all time high, uh, I think that we can say with decent confidence that had to do with the ETS being approved in January. Um, and large, large uh, financial institutions offering products. Um, and opening up a whole new cohort of institutional investors 
pension funds, endowments, you know, sovereign wealth funds were able to get access to Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin's price volatility uh, and exposure that way has driven a lot of demand. Um, You know, post having, I mean, it went off the way it was supposed to, Um, you know, the blocks confirmed and all that. Um, There was a tremendous amount of activity in the first block and then a couple of the subsequent ones. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of ordinal for ordinal sake and a lot of this, you know, BRC20 and rune activity. I did think it was going to be a little bit more sustained than it was. It really sort of shot up to, you know, catastrophically high levels, particularly that first block was like 40 Bitcoin of transaction fees or something like that um, uh, in that range. Uh, And then it really fell off a cliff. Um, and it looks like runes are really struggling to, to gather momentum and confidence to get back to where they were just leading up to the halving. Maybe it comes back. I don't think anything ever dies. Now GameStop and AMC are doing super well again. Uh, so I'm sure runes will have another crack at it. Um, but um, I guess, you know, the ETF, an all-time high, wasn't as much of a, su- a, 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 of a surprise. You had lots of very strong narratives going to the halving. Um, And then if you switch to just transaction fee um, uh, volatility, that was not as much of a surprise because, you know, runes were definitely something hyped going into it. Uh, If anything, I'm surprised that that um, uh, fell off as quickly and dramatically as it did. And we haven't seen transaction fees come 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 back to it. Ordinals really like if you just look at, you know, transaction fees, ordinals have really produced like two Eiffel Towers uh in in that chart there was like the initial you know frenzy uh around this time last year um when ordinals you know first you know broke onto the scene and then uh right around the having again uh uh around runes but outside of that there hasn't been really sustained um organic growth uh uh re- at least reflected in the transaction fee market maybe that maybe you can make the argument that, you know, that growth is happening elsewhere and you have to look at it uh, a little bit differently. But just by going by cold, hard on on chain metrics, um, you know, that the, the, the fall off was a bit of a surprise to me. Yeah, definitely. It's it's fascinating the duna- dynamics on, 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 the, on the blockchain, on, on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, you, are, you also sent me before for the preparation a little bit about yourself and you were saying like you're a recovering lawyer. Uh, which I, I found interesting and funny. Um, do you think our legal system in general is is a fair one? Do you f- do you feel like it's 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 uh, doing what it is supposed to do? Um, that's a that that's a hard question. Um, is it fair? No, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair. Um, and I think it's really dependent on what sector you look at. I think um, at least in the U.S. Uh, it's certainly the one that we have, and it's evolved this way over time for a reason. It definitely benefits, um, I would say, corporations, large corporations, more than it does, you know, entrepreneurs, startups, small small business owners, things like that. Um, if you look at uh, um, specific segments of the legal system, um, one of the one of the crowning achievements in the American legal system was bankruptcy law particularly in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, And that was meant to provide structure for orderly liquidation of failed companies to the benefit of creditors and also to the benefit of uh, those going through bankruptcy by slowing things down, taking a snapshot and um, having a process in place for an orderly liquidation or restructuring. That was a that was a great system, which I think has largely um, been bastardized in the last couple of um, decades, going back to the Lehman crisis and uh, GE bailouts and things like that, Um, corporate interests and and shareholder interests. And really, you know, uh, the the folks that are um, uh, uh, really driving the process itself, the lawyers, the accountants, the consultants are becoming, you know, fantastically wealthy through this process. Um, And I I pick on that one because of FTX, right? So FTX um, creditors, people, uh, who had funds at FTX and 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 lost those funds? Um, I, I I don't know if these are the exact figures. I believe it's in the range of like 1.3 billion, but legal fees alone have already outstripped that. 
So when you see um, when you see that like creditors are going to be made whole, well, they're not like the, the dollar value. They lost out on the crypto that they held. A lot of that crypto, if it's Bitcoin and Solana, uh, definitely not Ethereum. That's not really doing anything. But Bitcoin and Solana have done quite well, and they're not seeing that price increase. They got frozen in time, and they are going to be you know made whole on that snapshot. But that that really is not reflective of the whole situation. So I think you know just using that as an example, and then if we look at a lot of the uh, approach elsewhere. Um, you know, I believe the tornado uh, developers uh, were convicted earlier this morning. Um, we see, you know, a whole scale attack on open source software developers, you know, in Bitcoin and throughout the broader crypto space happening now. Um, this is special, special interests that are driving a lot of these really harsh regulatory um, uh, impediments to the industry. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly biased in, in, in some regard, um, but I don't think it's I don't think it's a fair system. I think it's definitely got away from some of the like core tenants of um, of what the legal system is supposed to provide, you know, citizens. There's a question that I like it, it comes up a lot of the times in, in, in uh, my podcast because I think a lot about it, how the world of politics, the world of the legal system, the world of of yeah, our world in general actually evolves when this Bitcoin thing, as we all believe, will actually work out and it will be like a base layer monetary system. I mean, all Bitcoiners have kind of like different versions of how this can look. Uh, and there were Bitcoiners on my podcast show that says like the US dollars and fiat system will always be bare. Then there are uh, Bitcoiners on there that uh, think that in the next three years, the fiat system, the complete fiat system will die. I think both a little bit <laughs> extremist, but they're, they're like from from various ranges. Uh, in in the broader sense, I also feel like there's a current war on freedom, privacy, open source, all those those things that are kind of interrelated to each other. Um, how 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 do you see that? Like is it, like first of all, probably you agree with me that, that there's like a war going on against freedom, privacy, and open source. Um, and then when a growing Bitcoin economy comes in there where a lot of Bitcoiners actually um, fight for those freedom and privacy uh, uh, rights a lot and they also value that a lot and I feel like also Bitcoiners that come in Bitcoin often get orange built in a privacy sense. For example, I was before absolutely not concerned about it. Now I'm getting more and more concerned about it. Uh, and, and in that sense, like how do you see this playing out in the long run and Bitcoin, this this mindset of Bitcoin, but also the asset Bitcoin uh, gets more and more involved in the world. Um, you know, uh, freedoms and privacy are, are largely uh, a myth at this point. I think that there's been so much of, um, of a crackdown on that for so long. I, I feel like open source software is a tool to reclaim some of those. It's 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 one it's one weapon that. Um, is under attack now for obvious reasons. Um, but, you know, I think that we lost so much ground in terms of, you know, self-sovereignty as individuals um, and, you know, right to privacy as individuals. And, you know, I, I say this as an American through an American perspective, it's very different for people, you know, in other parts of the world. Um, um, but, you know, I think that there has been uh, a concerted effort to erode a lot of those um, those uh, rights that Americans uh, probably take for granted over the last couple of decades, maybe, you know, longer than, you know, 9-11, certainly, you know, into the 90s and 80s as well. Um, it's going to be very difficult to get it back. The cool thing about open source software is uh, once it's out there, it's out there. Um, and, you know, these tools are becoming, you know, stronger in a way um, to the point where they have to make examples of individuals that develop it. Um, but, you know, with the tools, there's always another wave of innovators and, and people who want to, you know, um, uh, continue to push back at some of the erosion of these rights. I think we're going to see in the next, you know, however many years, it's going to be a cat and mouse game um, where there will be, you know, leaps forward for privacy preserving technologies and then, you know, leaps forward for, you know, government enforcement and surveillance to um, counteract some of those um, privacy preserving mechanisms. Um, 
it's an unfortunate situation. I think it's through education and through highlighting the benefits of, uh, of financial freedom uh, and um, financial self-sovereignty and privacy rights um, that we're able to shine a little bit of a light because I think most Americans, most most people would agree that that's a, that that's something that you know ought to be um, protected. We do we do a lot of work at PubKey with the Human Rights Foundation, focusing on a lot of the initiatives uh, in this area. Um, and one of my favorite ones to point to is uh, an activist. Her name is um, Roya Maboub, and she used she's been using Bitcoin since 2012 um, to fund uh, women's education in Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, women are not allowed to have their own bank accounts. They have um, heavily restricted access to their own, you know, finances. They have to go through um, a patriarch or, you know, uh, another uh, uh, male in their life um, to access these things. Um, But Bitcoin provides uh, um, uh, uh, a lifeboat, really, for people to have some sovereignty uh, and take matters into their into their own hands. So if you explain to people, uh, uh, at least in America, if you're explaining Bitcoin through the lens of Elizabeth Warren, who is saying this is for, you know, sex trafficking and money launderers and drug dealers, you know, that's something that may resonate with her base. But if you were to explain that exact same story about funding, you know, uh, girls education in Afghanistan and why this is an important um, uh, tool that enables and facilitates that, then the whole concept of you know money laundering becomes quite um, complicated, but also uh, uh, is a, a little bit more illuminated in some ways. I feel like uh, the Western world, especially the elites, and like even to a certain extent, uh, the middle class is sometimes too arrogant to understand uh, Bitcoin. They they live in a in a in a in a Western world bubble uh, where they don't see the use cases like it, it it really like gives me angry in my heart when when i get like a comment on youtube or x or something like that where it's like oh but what's the use case of bitcoin i'm like open your eyes please <laughs> like ju- ju- just look a little bit outside of your twitter uh bubble and and see where actually people are struggling and what 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 bitcoin actually can do for for the world and, and for uh, people that don't have, uh, with, with the birth, uh, a bank account and, uh, access to credit and all the financial instruments that it, because fiat, I mean, this is quite known with all the listeners here, but th- the closer that you are to the money printer, the, the better it is for you. And when someone is really far off, uh, they, they, they see the, the use case of Bitcoin and someone is really close to the money printer, of course. They don't see the use case of Bitcoin that much, or they don't want to see the use case of Bitcoin in cases of, of, of like Jamie Dimon and, uh, and people like that. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, in the case of Jamie Dimon, I think that he does see it and he does get it. He's just, you know, biased in a different way for, for you know, his business is about, you know, regulatory moats and control and oversight, surveillance, things like that. Um, so that makes sense. It's the people. It's the people that you know would uh, would get it if they put in the time and the effort. And it's really difficult to give them a book on Bitcoin, show them a podcast, come to the conference, and not to you know make this about um, PubKey. But one of the things that we try to do, we, we have a joke. It's like giving a dog a medicine. You, you you hide the pill and you hide the pill in like peanut butter or cheese or something like that. If they're not going to take the medicine on their own. Um, you got to kind of put the orange pill in peanut butter or a beer or something. Uh, and hopefully people can start to see through repetition. Um, it doesn't happen at once. It's not one conversation. It's not one book in most cases, because most people don't want to hear, you know, something that they something that makes them uncomfortable. And like Bitcoin is not is not a comfortable thing. It opens up uh, your eyes to lots of um, injustices in the world that have been happening over the course of centuries and are like systemic uh, and deeply entrenched. Um, and a lot of people just don't want to fucking think about that. Um, you know, it's that character in the matrix where he just wants the fake stake. Um, and that, that has to be something that I think Bitcoiners are comfortable with, like understanding that Bitcoin's not for everybody. It's for anyone uh, is a really important thing because not, not everybody is going to be able to get there. Um, uh, at least not in our lifetime, I, I think. I mean, it's. I feel like um, 
I always make the comparison with the TCP/IP protocol, where uh, everybody uses the TCP/IP protocol in some sense, uh, but how many people can actually understand it? Like how many people can actually, uh, in 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 a good way, explain what it does uh, and 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 why it's important and what's the history of it? And I feel like with with Bitcoin, it will be a similar route. I mean, far off in the future, but. Uh, uh, I see a f future where everybody uses Bitcoin because it is actually the base layer of our financial system. Uh, and then there is layer two, layer three, layer whatever. Uh, and this is like a, a lot of questions on how the scaling goes and, and how exactly this this will point out. But uh, it's somehow we will do it, I feel like. Um, and people will use it without even knowing it. Uh, and uh, it will be normal, like sending an email. And there's also like uh, people that ask me, oh, uh, you're doing a daily Bitcoin podcast and I have now 123, like one, two, three today's episode actually. Uh, and uh, they ask me like, oh, uh, how, how long will you do it? And I'm like, as long as it is interesting, like Bitcoin uh, will be probably interesting for the next like five, 10, 20 years. But at some point, Bitcoin will be so present in all our lives that I will be bored with it. Like it will be like talking about uh, email or the HTTP, HTTP, HTTPS uh, protocol or something like like that's that's always there, but you don't look at it specifically because like it's so there like air to breathe or something like that. I don't want yeah. to have a podcast about emails. <laughs> like, yeah, but, look, but, but that's a really that's a really great analogy. And, uh, but just to touch on uh, on one thing, there was a very big fight um, in the you know. Uh, early internet protocol days um, around embedding privacy pr preserving mechanisms in the internet protocol and particularly around TCP over IP. And there was a decision made to like not have some of these privacy preserving mechanisms. You know, it, 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 it's, it's like looking at core development and what we're pri prioritizing. There's, there's, there's no, um, there's no adding of features or functionality without trade-offs. And, and that's what is, has been so um, complicated and difficult for people to understand in the Bitcoin core development process. There's only trade-offs at the end of the day. Um, privacy is an important one, um, but it comes with, you know, uh, <laughs> trade-offs, not to be a broken record. Um, and, and that same argument and fight happened uh, in the early days of, the develop of developing uh, the Internet um, protocol. And just to go back to, you know, your, your podcast and, and really for all of these things, it has to be interesting and fun and consistent. Like if you stop having fun, you should stop doing the podcast or at least take a break. But as long as it's fun and it gives you energy and it gives other people energy, um, then definitely keep going. Yeah, I always say like um, it, it's sometimes like these days. Like when you do it every day, there are days where you feel more motivated to do it and sometimes like where you'll feel less motivated to do it in the first place. And the interesting thing is like always when you come out of the conversation, it's always like a high because it was always like there's a new person, you you learn something new with every guy, a uh, girl I had in the podcast, there's always something new in there. It gets, of course, less and less because when you have so many Bitcoins on, you you hear <laughs> a lot of the, the same thing, but you always hear also something new. Uh, and and yeah, my my main my, my main thing is like I try to make it interesting for me because then it probably has a good chance to be also interesting for the listener. Uh, because I listen to all of my podcasts, of course, because I'm in the conversation. Uh, and if I get bored there is probably a high likelihood that someone that listens very regularly to my show, that they are also getting bored from it. So I try to keep it interesting for me, at least, uh, because I can only guess what the viewer wants. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Trust me, I got it. <laughs> uh, uh, perfect. And uh, for the end routine, and uh, this is what uh, is actually kind of like set in stone at this, t this time, the end routine. Before we come to the actual end routine, uh, I have one more question. What are you currently extremely passionate about that we did not cover in the podcast? Like I'm always really fascinated with Bitcoiners. They have so many different things in their life and they are learning about new things every day. Uh, so I like want to, to get uh, like a side that we, we don't uh, hear usually about or is there something that we did not touch in the podcast that you are really passionate about or learning deep about? Huh. Well, 
building building the community in New York, building the community back in New York, it didn't completely die. I ha- I always have to give a shout out to um, uh, New York Bit Devs and the team that has kept um, the Socratic Seminar and Bit Devs moving. The folks at Chain Code Labs. There's a lot of good Bitcoiners in New York, but um, we put a much more public face on that here, and that gave me a tremendous amount of energy, uh, and I really love doing it. Um, I'm very excited to to bring that to other communities, other cities, um, as you know, PubKey continues to grow. Um, we're really looking forward to that, and people people are asking us to come to their city, which is you know something that um, is is heartwarming, but also just a lot of responsibility. I think that you know Bitcoiners are looking for community everywhere, and not everybody's in New York. So to the extent that we can help you know, communities, whether it's a pub key or a different community build, that's something I'm really excited about because that's much more visibility. And I think going into election, election season here, we're seeing, you know, politicians be a little bit more cautious with how they speak about Bitcoin. I think that there is a forming voter block that's going to become more and more important as we go. Um, I have not been active in a political sense uh, for ever. Uh, really. Um, but it is really interesting to see how these communities are starting to um, engage with politicians on a hyper local level. And we're starting to see that bubble up to national, you know, federal, international levels as well. Um, and I hope that that momentum continues. I think that we, we need to we need to to, um, you know, give Bitcoin a little bit of breathing room, give the developers breathing room to innovate and continue to bring better products and services uh, to the global community. Um, it's a lot of work, um, for sure. And, you know, I'm excited to be a, a, a small part of it. And I'm excited to see other people um, um, really get energy and um, uh, want to, you know, get themselves into the mix as well. I, I'm also really envy about that uh, in American politics, Bitcoin is a topic. In Austrian politics, because Austria also has election and you also has election, I did not hear anything about Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm really envy that uh, in, in America, at least the politicians are forced to speak about it. I heard something that, that Trump talked about it. I did not hear anything from Biden to this day, but I'm also not really big in, in well, politics Biden in America. The administration is extremely, extremely hostile towards it. It, it. They don't talk about it that much, but in what they what they do, they've been very, very hostile. And look, maybe it's a good thing. Uh, Bitcoin is not the biggest problem in America that politicians should be talking about. This is like an easy thing for them to focus on because they don't want to they don't want to focus on other parts of the house that are on fucking fire. Um, so it, it's much easier for them to talk about, you know, tabloidy items, which, you know, Bitcoin kind of is right now. Bitcoin's still tiny. And, um, you know, it, it, it would be nice if politicians focused on infrastructure and other systemic issues. Um But, you know, if they're going to battle out Bitcoin, I hope that, you know, we land on the right side of it and they just sort of like leave us alone and allow developers to develop. Yeah, I was uh, I usually really don't listen to politics, but I listened to the um, leading candidates debate, the first leading candidates debate in in Austria for the EU um, election in in June, I think it is. Um, And I was so disappointed with the topics because the topics all kind of related only to the Ukraine crisis with Ukraine and, and Russia. And I was like, of course, it's a topic. And of course, people are uh, interested in that. But it's not the only thing. <laughs> like, yeah. We can also talk about other stuff, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, the whole, um, process is, the, the, the whole process can be, you know, quite depressing. Uh, I, I look forward to it all, you know, being over uh, in November. Um, but you know, then there's always, you know, an, another problem just around the corner. <laughs> there, there's always something going on in politics. Um, now to the actual end routine where the previous guest is asking, um, a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, I, I love this, this end routine because it always brings up something interesting. Uh, the question for you is what has to happen for you to leave your country? Like in that sense, America. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jeez. Uh, well, what has to happen? Well, I guess there's good and bad in that, right? Like better opportunities elsewhere or a lack of opportunities here are, are the, 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 the broad strokes. Um, 
if if Bitcoiners become villainized to a certain extent and it and it prevents, you know, opp opportunity and, you know, the right to um, uh, enjoy enjoy life as an American, then that would be probably the negative aspect that drives me out. Um, the positive aspect is, I mean, I don't know, maybe I get a great job opportunity in Fiji or something and, uh, we're going, we're going to go open up pub key Fiji. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would definitely come to that <laughs> at some point. <laughs> uh, Th Thomas, it was a, a pleasure talking with you and, and interviewing you, uh, and getting your insights. Um, when people want to reach out to you, ask you questions, uh, like s follow you, uh, where can, where can people find uh, most of your stuff? Yeah. Uh, so I'm, um, I'm T Pakia on Twitter. It's my first initial last name, T P A C C H I A. Um, you can follow me, DM me on Twitter. Um, also pubkey underscore NYC is our main account for, for pubkey. Um, and, uh, we have an open telegram channel for pubkey as well for people to, to, to hop into. We're, we're pretty accessible there. Um, it's community. So, uh, we, we generally respond to everybody. Um, even people that have dot F, uh, in their handle, we'll, we'll get to them eventually. It might take a couple more days, uh, than normal, but, um, yeah, we're always around. Come have a beer with us. It'd be, it'll be a pleasure to buy you an orange pill when you're in New York City. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, thank you, Thomas, for being on. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.